76, 74, one second. Randy Hughes, it's no good. Sasha Burger, Dixon wins. Dixon wins. And pandemonium has broken loose here on this floor. The Dixon Bulldogs are just literally being swamped. The Missouri State Class M champions. The Dixon Bulldogs, 36 wins and no losses for the year. Well, good evening. It's great to see everyone here. My name is Tommy Nichols. I'm a jack of all trades. But uh, I take great pride in uh, being a teacher in this Dixon school system. And it is an awesome system to, ha to be working in to have your children attend you. Just like it was back in 1969. It's a, it's a pleasure of mine. It's, uh, this has been a team that, of course, I grew up watching and then uh, later been thinking about them quite often. But, uh, We've got a really good program for everyone. Yeah, I think you're really going, I'm sure you're really going to enjoy it. During this uh, championship year in 69, I was a sixth grader. Uh, I remember I used to watch them during warm up drills. And they, I can't remember if they ran the tip drill. You guys run the tip drill? During, I guess you, you ran a tip drill. But anyway, what I remember the ball never hit the floor. Never, never hit the floor. I remember them running, I call it a cross drill, I'm not sure what the correct term is, but where they take, take the, uh, get the ball, take a jump shot from the edge of the free throw line, and they never missed. And as a sixth grader, I thought, that's just the way it is. You're wide open at the free throw line, and you just, you don't miss. And I remember Miller Howe, Paul's father, Preaching, you couldn't really call it talking because if Miller was going to talk basketball or baseball to you, he's preaching to you, and you better listen. But I remember him, yes. And he was talking about free throw shooting. Concentrate, he said. Concentrate. If someone's going to give you the opportunity to shoot unguarded from just 15 feet out in front of the basket, you should never miss. So, when I look at this team back then, I really miss not having a lot of fans here with us today. Fans that have been diehard believers in not just this team, but the Dixon School District. And probably the one I miss the most is the one that had the early success and saw the potential in this team of boys. And that's Miller Cap. There are those that I think about that had a lot to do with this team. I remember those like Howard and Blanche Wolf. Then there's Ray Donald and Nancy Baker. And Jim Toner, bless his soul. I sure wish he was with us here today. He'd love this. Frank Nolmeyer, Lord Burgess, Bobby Daddy, rest his soul. He was a very good friend. I, I miss him so much. But there are so many people out here, and you all know who you are. There's those that couldn't be with us tonight. <laughs> And, uh, but Miller, Miller was the man who had the dream. And if you could ever say a dream came true, this one did. Oh, uh, they were good. <laughs> they, uh, but uh, some of the games, you know, I, I went, guess we went to every one of them. And uh, it's, it's hard to select one or all them. But one I really remember uh, was when they were, Playing in the finals of the Lebanon tournament, and uh, we came in. We just happened to be behind. Them. Uh, they were playing Rolla. They were undefeated, I believe. I'm not mistaken. And uh, they had their windows all down, and they were singing. What was that song? We're going to bury old John we're, Brown. We're going to bury old John. John Brown's yeah. body lies a molding in the grave, yeah. and they had a. <laughs> Had him up on a pole with this whole thing in you know, Yeah, he, he's still there. And hanging it, you know, and, that was, and uh, they were singing that real loud. And we could hear it, you know. He, he had about 40 points the first half. You know. <laughs> he buried them. One person I want to introduce is uh, Mr. Stalka, Ron Stalka. Right here. Stand up. So there you go. You stand up for just a second. Stand up. Uh, he was the, the boys' junior high coach. 
Retired from 2001 after 47 years of education. For a few years, anyway, our program, our junior high program, did not belong to the Missouri State High School Activities Association. And uh, he told me, he said, I can remember them losing a game during their junior high years. They played 40 some games. I think he told me, was it 36 and 0 in one year and 38 and 0 in the other year? Yes. So that's, uh, we got started early. Uh, they were a very good team, obviously, and in order to get some competition, Mr. Stalkup arranged with Jim Toner, the high school coach at the time, here in Dixon, to scrimmage our junior varsity. And he said we scrimmaged him about once a week for several weeks and defeated them quite convincingly. And one day Toner made the comment, no, you cannot scrimmage the varsity. <laughs> Well, see, the girls were swimming, and I went to Sigma Bowl game. But when they won the, the championship, I went to Ralph and I didn't win it. And I yelled, yelled, and she and I yelled, and they told us to shut up and see if we watched. <laughs> the old team wanted us to be quiet. I remember that about it. <laughs> Coach Oval made no bones about his, his voice. And I'm told, and I can't tell you who told me, I can't tell you who told me most of these things. But uh, they went to St. James. Now, I don't, don't know if he went along to Scout or if, I'm not sure why. But anyway, Archie Whitaker was, was the principal. Uh, which uh, Archie's not here, is he, Chief? Oh, I wish he were here. Um, I'm told that Archie and another gentleman, I'm not sure who it was, but they went to see St. James play. Well, St. James was an awfully good team that year as well and was undefeated, and we were going to play them at Dixon. A little bit later. And after that game was over, that they went to scout, someone came up to uh, Coach Oakland and asked him, Well, what do you think about the St. James bunch now? He said, You think you can beat them? And he said, Well, he said, I think, he said, if we work hard, he said, I believe. He said, I believe, but it'll probably be a 40 point game. I think we could be in by at least 40. <laughs> well, I guess there was almost a fight right there. They had to grab. Archie had to, or somebody had to get Coach Oval out while someone else, one of the others, held back this fan. And uh, he called Coach Oval in the next morning. He said, Coach, he said, you have got to tone it down a little bit. He said, we know you respect your boys, but, but, he said, you may be the only coach ever in the state of Missouri to win the state championship and get fired the same year. <laughs> I remember the last night at the ball game, I walked out to go to the restroom, and our friendly banker, Gene Elkins, here in town, was just pacing up and down the floor. He said, I'm so nervous, I'm going to have a heart attack. He didn't have the heart attack. We won the game, and everything went real nice. Okay. John Lipton John went to school at Union University in Jackson, Tennessee. Played three years as a member of the, what else, John? The Bulldogs. But after that, he, had, he went on into education. He coached two undefeated state championship teams at, uh, now correct me, John, Humboldt City Schools, That's a 14-0 football state champion, and a 34-0 girls basketball state champion. Then, he was a famous kid. He went to nearby, is it Medina? Medina. Started a football program from scratch, and over the, over the next 20 years, his team's won 11 district and regional championships and went undefeated eight seasons. At the same time, oh, there's more on John in here. John was the manager of this team. We didn't know what he had in. At the same time, his school also started a volleyball program for both boys and girls at the middle school level. He was the head coach for nine years. He won nine boys championships and eight girls championships. He's been a head girls middle school basketball coach, a high school assistant softball coach. His daughter, you, you know she wasn't under any pressure. His daughter earned all district, all, we, all region, and all West Tennessee honors her senior year. And he credits Dixon, at least partially his coaches here, for molding his coaching style. And he told me, he said, probably the one single greatest lesson that I ever took away from Coach Ogle was his never-ending need for conditioning. I'll never forget running the steps in the gym. My teams were always known for being fresh and having solid legs late in ball games. Now John spends his spare time hunting and fishing, 
due to traveling. He and his wife Bonnie also have served as short-term overseas missionaries, both in Romania and in Brazil. John Nelson. I remember running around the high school like all these kids you see now. But what I remember is the homecoming game when we played St. James, and uh, 200 people stood outside, couldn't get in. And I remember that they had to part them on the sideline to get the ball inbound. And I also remember the doghouse, which was uh, in the middle of the gym. And at homecoming, it was full of confetti, balloons, and all that. And so when the buzzer went off, the game was over, somebody pulled the cord, and the trap door opened, and the confetti came out on the floor, and everybody went crazy. Coach Lynn Whitman, assistant coach Whitman, right here in front of you. Now, when, when Coach Whitman found out I was going to MC this, I was trying to find a little bit of, I call it, clean dirt. Can't get too, you know, he's already 60s, you know, so I can't get too carried away here, but he said, you don't have any dirt on me. <laughs> well, Coach Whitman was my basketball coach and PE teacher in junior high. And I remember somebody asked him one day at practice if he had any kids. He said, no, don't have any kids. You going to have any kids? No, I'm not going to have any kids. But I want, you to tell, I want to tell you tonight he was wrong. He eventually has some children, two beautiful girls, and they are the brightest and, like I said, the prettiest young ladies you'd ever want to meet. No offense to the land, but they remind me so much of him and his wife, Jody, that it's just unbelievable sometimes. They're very sweet, and they should have to be very proud of their dad. Lynn Whitman. the 69 team. Going to every game. Go to my parents, my little sister, my aunt and uncle. No matter if it was rainy, sleep, snow, never missed. John Menzi called me. We actually I called him first, but he's called me several times. John was a manager on that 69 team. But you know John's name is not on that banner. And that's what threw me off. John came all the way from South Carolina to be with us today. And here I am. And um, now, correct me, avionics was your career, is that correct? Worked in avionics in Southern Illinois and then got into South Carolina. But I visited with his mother on the telephone, and since his name wasn't on the banner, I didn't know, even know him. And uh, she mentioned to me, and I did a little check in. It didn't take long to find out that, yes, sir, he was. They, they, they slaughtered Then the following Tuesday, they, uh, they played uh, St. James, and they were undefeated. And, uh, as I recall, uh, they, uh, St. James, and uh, Rolla, of course, they, they were St. James. And uh, 
I had told Nancy before I went to work that morning, I said, have supper ready and dinner, you know, whichever one you want to call it. And I said, we'll eat and go right, get right on over there because we won't, we won't be in season. I came home, took off early, and at 4.30, cars were lined up all the way down to 28. And so, you stuck so I, right oh, you stuck to me right quick. Oh, I told you, forget it. Yeah, I said, forget the eating. We're going. We got over there. Lucky enough to get in and get a seat. Okay, let's do some cheerleaders here. Janice? Who are you at? Janice Lifer Hughes. Nobody's going to tell me about that, Janice. You got you cheerleaders. You just don't talk about each other very well. She, I, I know she's married to Bill, but I don't know much else about her. But uh, Janice Lifer Hughes. I've got uh, Donna Evans Irvin. Now, Donna cannot be with us today. But uh, she also was a cheerleader. Uh, Penny Anderson Motes. Penny, I don't believe it's here, but correct? Okay. Jackie Cotton. Where are you, Jackie Cotton? <laughs> Jackie. Jackie has been to Peachtree City, Georgia. As for the last 17 years, she's into real estate. Into real estate. How's the real estate business right now? Not right. That's why you're here. <laughs> Anita. Anita Cross. Right here. Anita. <laughs> now, Anita, I embarrassed myself all ago because I said, where have you been all the last several years? She said, they're not here. <laughs> but she works evenings and, and has, to, has to rest during the day. She is a corrections officer with uh, the Jefferson City Correctional Center. You don't have to leave, you guys. I see you looking toward the door. But uh, Anita Cross, welcome. And then Norma Jean Harris. Norma Jean Withers Harris. Norma Jean Harris is building. And she gave me this, this little brief bio. I've got my own stories on Norma Jean. We're like brother and sister. We're very tight, very close. And I remember whenever I was a kid, it would have been about your senior year. You ready for this? <laughs> yes, you are. Ready for this. You ready for this? Oh, Norma no. Jean, was, I forgot where we were at, but it was in the winter and she was taking her coat off, or putting it on. You were putting her coat on. <laughs> she doesn't know what I'm going to say. She, you were putting her coat on, and I started to help you with it, and you said, I've got it. And I said, Yes, you do. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful lady. I'm very close to her again today. We are like brother and sister. Oh my gosh, it was totally awesome season. I remember every game I was at all of it. And, there, and a lot of people said they didn't like Ogle, but I liked him because he let me play in one game. I got to play in one varsity game against Dalton, so I, my memories of that, it was great. Totally awesome. But every game was great. Every game was great. In fact, I took great honor whenever I was a kid because uh, a lot of people thought we looked alike and they called me Little Dale. And I really took a lot of pride in that. Little did I know. <laughs> but Dale, and what most people don't realize is that Dale was actually the playmaker for this state championship team. And they don't know how Dale was still there on the bench and he was giving the, the plays. Coach Ogle and Miller, no one else, no one else knew exactly what to do. Dale Dake knew what to play to run. And all the players looked to him. <laughs> okay. Dale used to joke and tell me how he got in the game. Oh, I think maybe I the longest I ever got into the game was about 38 seconds, maybe 39 seconds. But I, I found out that wasn't true. Because I have a copy of the scorebook, and I saw where he was in double figures one time. I was in that 172 point game against Stout <laughs> that I did not dare bring up today. <laughs> but of course, we had nine players in double figures that game. But everybody doesn't have to know that. Game. 
Dale's forte, though, seriously, was baseball. One of the best hitters to ever come out of Dixon High School. Led the team in the spring of 1969 with a better than 450 batting average, and he was an outstanding outfielder and for a very good team. I'll, get, I'll tell about that in a moment. And Dale was tough. He got hit in the mouth by a pitch, got some teeth knocked out, and was still ready to play. <laughs> I remember as a younger kid, he uh, stood in the third base one time. I believe third base, but he, but he got spiked by an opposing player. And uh, that may have been the last time he ever slid into the base. But the only thing I ever remember was him diving into the bases. There's a photo of, of him in the Jefferson City paper one time of him, of him diving into home plate. And they said it was Dale Day. Uh, you, all you could see was a, the, the ball of his feet and a hat and dust. That was it. Dale told me that, yeah, he was a pretty, pretty fair baseball player, pretty good hitter. But he said that once pitchers, pitchers found out how well he didn't hit what he called the old equalizer, of course, that old equalizer was the curveball. And it's really many a good hitter and a future baseball player. But uh, what people don't realize about this baseball team, and I'll tell you the story here in just a minute, I want to introduce another player first, but Dale Day. Another player on that team is no longer with us, and that's Ken Acorn. <laughs> Ken was an unbelievable guy, and once he was your friend, he was your friend for life. He'd do anything that he could for you, anything he needed, he was that he was the type to help. Passed away a few years ago, I want to say, of uh, throat cancer, but uh, he had so much just raw baseball talent. But uh, he's, like I said, no longer with us, and we, with him gone, there's really a big boy in this group of young men. Kenny Acor. <laughs> what I uh, what I wanted to mention about the baseball team at that time, the state of Missouri did not recognize classes. So every team throughout the state was in one big class. You were just grouped together. So we made it. Now, so Dale can correct me, maybe. Uh, we, uh, I will say we made it to the quarterfinals. And we were, were we defeated. Paul, you remember, were we beat in Springfield? Yeah, you got beat by Oak Grove. Oak Grove in Springfield. That was in the Elite Eight of the final eight teams in the state of Missouri. We're talking about all schools, the big city schools, we were one of the top eight. I firmly believe, without a doubt, had we had divisions, we would also be looking at a 1969 state baseball champion. Watching my sister cheerlead. Yep. In the Cheering them on. I'm too young. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. That's about it, because I think I was, what, sixth grade? Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Okay, Dean Dickens. Where you at, Dean? Here you are. <laughs> Dean, uh, Dean just retired after working uh, with the U.S. Forest Service after 28 years, all in Missouri. Of course, he traveled around a lot, but he worked for the U.S. Forest Service in Missouri. And uh, Dean had a lot of talent as well. What most people don't understand is that our second string, our so-called second string, could beat anyone else around here quite handily as well. The result we see in some of those high scores. But uh, he was able to prove, to prove himself the next year. And uh, what he remembers most was that he had, he told me one time, he said, I couldn't believe we'd walk into a gym and they would be just packed two hours before a game. And he also told me has very fond memories of that final game, of course, in Columbia against Oran. But uh, the packed gym, as he said, it was, it was awesome. Dean Dix. I didn't know what a basketball was in 1969. Never played the game until about 70 or 71. So I don't remember much. <laughs> Sorry. Danny Richardson. Danny won't 
tell me a thing. <laughs> he will not tell me. He told me he worked for a bridge. He was a bridge, bridge construction worker for West Plains Bridge, and uh, he said he retired from that. And uh, but he got bored. Now he's at Walmart. He works with Walmart, but. He will not tell me anything, good, bad, in between, makes no difference. I can't get a thing out. I will get something. <laughs> Danny Rickerson. Thank you. <laughs> Mike Burgess cannot be with us. He lives in Rolla now. But Mike was also a very quiet individual, as I remember. Richard McMillan was also going to be here, but as I understand it, Richard was not feeling well. Okay, it could not be with us, but uh, Richard was a big part of the team the next year. I guess that would have been his senior year. Is that correct, Coach King? He was a junior in 69, and the next year was his. He made a big contribution. Yes, I can remember being at Columbia that evening, and we, our hands were worn out by the time it was over with. And we laughed and hollered until we was hoarse. <laughs> and, but we never did get sleepy. And we thought it was the most wonderful thing we've been through. Henry Howell. Now retired, retired from USPS, correct? Spends a lot of time with his grandkids fishing, and they tell him that he ended up with some special part-time job of some kind. And I don't know. I think it's some must be something illegal. <laughs> but uh, but he is he's back working again, and he is gone quite a bit. But uh, uh, it's some kind of federal job. When they played in Springfield, you know, we had just had Tammy. She was just like a month, two months old. And we took her to Springfield. My mother lived there. And after the ball game was over, Henry came up, sat behind us and said, Mother, give me the kid. Well, that, there was two old ladies sitting there, and they said, I wish you would look at that. That boy has Excuse just me. finished playing basketball, and he's up here taking that hey, Now, they're not supposed to play ball, but they've got babies. <laughs> it was so uh, fun. Mike Sim. Mike lives in, uh, is it Grace Summit, Mike? Near there? Okay. <laughs> retired now. He told me lots of stories about all you guys. <laughs> we probably talked, I think we talked on the phone an hour or more on two or three different calls. But unfortunately, I cannot tell any of those stories. <laughs> they tell me he was a pretty fair pitcher on the baseball diamond at one time. And I'd like to see that, being an old baseball coach. But Mike Sims. Uh, another sad note is that we've lost a, another player, and uh, we'll talk about him and tell some of the stories about him and his talents, but uh, Randall Irvin. And I think is, I know Randall's sister's over here somewhere. I didn't mention Kenny's sister over here. I saw C. Loretta and Kenny's wife. Oh, okay, I see. Oh, there's several of y'all here. I'm sorry. But, uh, and Wilda Landers and Joyce Hickey, where are you all at? Right down front here, okay. These are Randall's sisters. Randall uh, passed away several years ago. You know, you lose track of time. I'm not sure how long it's been. Nine seven. Nine seven. Goodness. But when he was playing basketball in high school, there was no one better. There were, there were no better, no better, it was shooter or ball handler combinations in the state of Missouri, certainly that were any better. Ned Reynolds from KY3, been a sports anchor at KY3 in Springfield since about 1965. I saw him at a jury basketball game a few weeks ago. He made a comment about Randall. He said, he was one player that had the quickest hands of just about any player I ever saw. Quick on defense, he would have been, and he was, very difficult to guard and to be guarded by. Randall Irvin.
was in the pet club then. And they won every game. Unbelievable. Okay. Oh, here's another good one. Fred Howell.
But if he said, you know what? He said, I don't recall not one of the other guys ever seen the word in about it. I've never forgotten how team spirit was broken and built in that one day. <laughs> so Coach O was just taking care of it. I remember the night of the championship game, we were being uh, babysat by Pam Evans, and whenever the game, we were listening to it on the radio, when the game ended, my brothers and sister were just jumping up and down on mom and dad's bed, and I remember jumping off the bed and giving a big old smooch to Pam Evans, and Pam went, man, and that's kind of what I remember about the night of the championship game. I remember that um, we went to a lot of the games. My dad was real excited about the basketball team, and very supportive, and our family just uh, really enjoyed everything about the season and everything leading up to the championship. We were always supportive. John Brown.
uh, asked Coach Stewart, or read Coach Norm Stewart's book. He wrote in his autobiography that, quote, the signing of John Brown was the turning point for us as a college basketball program. That got us over the hump. It turned us into a force in college basketball. And John was the big dang athlete that we had signed. And things went up for MU from there. Excuse me. While at MU, John was the team captain in 72 73. The club went 21 6 overall, 9 and 5 in the, at that time the Big 8 conference, tied for second under Coach Stewart. And during that season, John's team got off to a 12 0 start until losing State, 70 50, 70 55. John also led the Tigers to the NIT in both 72 and 73, won the Big 8 holiday postseason tournament titles in 71 72. In the NIT on March 17th of 73, John set a team record with 16 rebounds against UMass. And during that 72, three, 72 and 73 season, the Tigers were ranked as high as 7th in the country in the polls. He was eventually drafted in the first round, 10th overall by the NBA's Atlanta Hawks in 1973. He made his mark with them immediately. And still... His number at MU is not retired. That's unbelievable. Get it done. Well, I'm working on it. <laughs> After an NBA that includes playing with Atlanta and then stops in Chicago and Utah before making it back to Atlanta, John went a few years to Europe, scored 3,614 points in the NBA, had 2,126 rebounds. His best year, set was 74 75, he averaged 11.2 points a game. And he told me one time, it's been a long time ago, he told me once that he blocked or tried to block, a dunk by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and he thought he, that he had suffered a broken hand. <laughs> Since retiring from pro ball, he has purchased the 621 real estate office in Rolla, owns a very successful construction company as well, still plays basketball. <laughs> Mr. John Brown.
in 71. He played for the Panthers. He played for Coach Edsel Matthews. While he was there, he became oh, an average player. He was the assist leader for his career with 793 assists. He still holds that record today, folks, yeah. for Drew. You know, all these years, we only have, we've only retired one of them, Big Johns. And uh, that's since Dixon existed. Of course, that's number 50. Everybody, everybody sees it when everybody goes to the gym. That number, that number 50 will never again be worn by a boys basketball player here at Dixon. Well, Coach Brandon and I were talking earlier this school year. Well, you know, we decided it was time to consider another. And we didn't take this lightly. We really talked about it and thought about it. And we knew that how important a decision that, that it was. It's awfully difficult to unretire a number, you know. So I started doing a little work, put some figures together based upon some old scrapbooks that I had, some that some other people had. Talked to some college officials, got some numbers together from them about this player. Once I had my, my facts, I went to our superintendent, this is Donna Burrow, and I said, what's the procedure for retiring numbers? Well, we, we don't have it. I mean, it's not something that you do very often. So she thought it would be a good idea for me to come to a school board meeting and discuss that with the board. So I asked to be placed on the agenda, and she said, no problem, she'll take care of that for the next school board member, or meeting. So I met with the board at their regular January meeting, and we voted, in, or I, I said we, <laughs> they voted unanim unanimously, they were in agreement. With, so with that, I would like to introduce to you the player whose number, along with John Brown, that will be forever retired by Dixon High School. And that is number 20. That player who wore that is Mr. Paul Howard. At this time, I'd like to introduce 
coach Tony Brink. I promise I'll make this shorter than time. <laughs> if I could have my basketball players come up here, please, JV and Varsity. They've been working tonight, most of them. And uh, I do appreciate them for being here. And uh, there's somebody that I need to put into my hall of fame as a coach. And uh, we would like DJ Howe to come up here as well, please. I know I, I didn't want to embarrass you, but this has to be done. Uh, after Tommy and I talked about retiring another, another jersey, came back and told me what the board had said. I got a phone call about two or three days later. Said, uh, this is DJ Howe. Said, I'm Paulson. Oh, that's neat, you know. How are you? He goes, I'm doing fine. He said, I understand you've uh, retired my dad's jersey. I said, yes, I, I just found out today. He said, that's really cool. He said, uh, by the way, I happen to work for Nike. Said, hey, I'm a coach, that means something to me. <laughs> He's like, I would like to donate uniforms to your boys' basketball program. Wow. Hey. Surprise my team. Uh, we warmed last night at Newburgh, they got us a win. We warmed today in Stalin, it didn't, so we're five hundred with the new uniforms, but I think we're gonna keep them anyway. Uh, but BJ went ahead and he, he got these two made uh, for his dad and John Bolt to keep. Those are for them as gifts. And he's had these made up for our gym at the high school. Lots of good memories, pleasant memories. Uh, just, just good memories. I, I can't think of anything in specific, but we were very happy that we had a son that was participating, got acquainted with all the players and their families, and, and the friendship has lasted for a long time. We liked it. Yep. <laughs> and the guy that called the play on the guy that was shooting the free throws, I went to high school with him. <laughs> She influenced that. Yeah, I, no, I, my brother was sitting next to me. He told me to keep my mouth shut. I would be a lot of trouble over that. Mr. Chris Holston, he is the president of the uh, Booster Club, and I'll let him speak with for a moment. Thanks, Tony. I won't keep you all too long. I just uh, thank you to the coach again for a very good meal this evening, and to the Booster Club officers and uh, board members that helped put this on for us this evening. Uh, Tommy and Tony, thank you for all we had, all the hard work you guys did on this as well. Uh, I'll thank you again for everybody up here. Thank to all the media outlets that helped us promote this event this evening. And thank you to the school board and administration for letting us utilize the facilities this evening. And I want to thank everyone up here at this table for coming out this evening. We appreciate it. Well, I loved all the kids. They had a good time playing ball. Everything was great. They had a big party and they got on. <laughs> That's about all I remember. There used to be a, a little uh, blip on TV on Saturday mornings on a little news thing, I guess, called You Were There. Maybe you saw that back in the day. Well, uh, I was there. On all these guys. Played the end of first game. 1968. 113 points, I believe it was, something like that. Pretty good. Wow. Uh, well, not too bad. Not too bad. Then Riston came to town a few days later. <laughs> oh my God, we had 92 points at half. 96 <laughs> points at half. That's a picture in Europe. So, 92 to 18, or something like that. 17, what is it, 10? But anyway, I thought, we are pretty good. You know, and not only are we pretty good, people began to understand because they had, you know, newspapers and things like that began to pick up on them. Well, this team up here in the middle of Missouri somewhere called Dixon, they're scoring an outrageous number of points. 
And then we played another three or four games. Well, back then we started early November this year, so now we start after December, after, or almost December after Thanksgiving. We get a Frisco League tournament, and it's a Stoutland that year. And we go down to Stoutland, and granted, they weren't the strongest team in the world, but we put 172 points. How do you score 172 points in one game? No three point line. You can't dunk it. You know, there's no. Yeah, you can. Can't you jump? <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's no, today also, the other change in the rules is, once you have a 30 point lead going into the fourth quarter, the clock never stops. Unless it's a timeout or something like that. It just runs continuously. So we, you know, you score 172 points, but no, we just score 200 with the three point line. Henry, Paul, Randall, Mike, all those guards, Derek Dean, Mike Burgess could shoot the eyes out of it. If we had a three point line, we got 200. You know, we got criticized for that, of course. You know, we understand that. But now the state had heard of Dixon. The state had heard of Dixon. Where is this town? And people began to come from all parts of the region and the area to watch this team play. And they were amazed. And I was amazed. You know, I sat there and watched it. I cannot believe Paul Howell made that pass. I cannot believe he made that pass. It was so good. It was just pure fluid. You know, or random would make that shot, or John would make that shot, or Fred or Henry, or whoever was in it, they could all play the game. But the year went on, we got into January, we had a game, of course, some of them real big, some of them not so big, uh, but we were still going. And then we got to February. February is kind of a bad month sometimes for basketball. All these guys can play, can tell you that. John knows that, Paul knows that, play through it. And uh, if you... You get stale, or you get tired, you get sick, you get hurt, injuries, all that kind of thing. We were sitting there one day, or we were playing, after practice, and, done, and Coach Oda put them all on stage. I remember this was plain as day, plain as day. And he said, you guys aren't trying. And that's when Randall threw the ball. Oh. <laughs> and he said, are you trying? Right? <laughs> Am I right? Yes, I am. And we had to clear that discussion. Yeah. But we were all to that point. Henry, Henry also made this comment. He said, you know, we played 36 games at the end of the year. We were tired. What, you know, for 16, 17, 18-year-old kids to play that many games, it just wore on them. And that pressure began to build just a little bit. And we were winning. People just constantly harassing us or hounding us. And calls made at the school. There's no telling how many calls that Ms. Leo would bring. The secretary had to screen through. Coaches calling. College coaches calling. All these people wanting attention with John or Rem or Henry or Fred, and they couldn't talk to Paul because he was just a sophomore. You see, so all of this began to, to come together. But well, we got to the Lebanon tournament. We got to the Lebanon tournament, first two games, get to play Rod in the finals. Rod comes to town with this big, made up old Civil War song, John Brown's Body Lies in the <laughs> They stood up and started singing. John Brown's body lies in the in the Scored 45 points. <laughs> and we did, you know, pretty good, pretty good. Lit, so, you know, just little things like that, uh, you know, it began to, to build up. Well, we had this team up here in North, northeast Missouri, well, North Central Missouri, called Herman. Y'all remember Herman Bearcats? And Herman was pretty good. And I don't know if they paid the Jefferson City Tribune paper or what, but the, the sports writer there seemed to lean toward Herman quite a bit. And anytime he could, he would talk about, well, Dixon's pretty good, but wait until they get to play Herman. And Herman will show up. So as the season wound down towards the end, we went into the district tournament and uh, had to play four games to get to you know, three different finals and played against uh, a very good future college Memphis State star, Bill Lauren, who John knows very well, good friend of him now. Uh, he tried to shoot us out of it, but uh, we had enough. He had 49, I think John had 45 that game. So we had enough to win. So we go on to that, and we go and win to the next two games against uh, Republic and Gainesville in the first two rounds of the state tournament, and then we get to Columbia. An old, smoky, dirty, dusty, Brewer Fieldhouse, John, I don't know how you ever got recruited when you saw that place the first time. You wouldn't go there today. 
would not go there to play today. They could not recruit. They still played North Great on, you can remember, old Brewer, and all Walter Davis, all the other guys that were there uh, 40 years ago. But the game was the dream game. And that's how the Jeff City paper put it. The dream game. Dixon versus Herman. Herman was this real slow, deliberate style of basketball. We were the running gun, press, full court, throw ball, shoot it, and all that type of thing. And they just knew that we were going to win. <coughs> Herman was going to show this little big program town of Dixon that, that, was, that we were not very good. Beat them 11. They were also going to beat them. <coughs> and we beat them 11 points in the semis. <coughs> so, that puts us up against Oran. And so now we're going to Saturday night, snow that night, by the way, about seven inches. And uh, Randall said, well, I hope we win, but the game was last night. He said, I'm going to be hurting more than anybody else. Because of what the Jeff City Pacers wrote about. He said, we're going to win, we're going to try to win, I hope we do win, we'll do all that kind of thing. He said, the game for me was the state championship game was in the tournament. And so anyway, we get into the old Rand game, you can watch the film. Uh, you know, the, the really sad thing here, one of the things, and I wrote this down, I don't remember to say it, one of the biggest regrets, and it's nothing we can do about it because technology wasn't there. Can you imagine how many video cameras would be in the stand if these kids were playing today, these young people were playing today? You know, we had the old black and black. You know, we didn't have one game at home that was filmed. We don't didn't have to. We just couldn't do it. Think how many video cameras are. This plain old cell phone was in taking pictures of these guys when they were playing. Unbelievable. And so when people ask me, how good were they? Can you tell me? And I said, you can't describe how good they were unless you were there. Because we just don't have that record. And that's so sad. That's what I said. But I can remember. They can remember as well. But anyway, we get to do a random game. Now, the thing is, we get down to this last little thing in 20 seconds, they get the ball. There was no foul. Did you think who called foul? Did you call foul? Was foul? Was foul? But there was no foul there. You know? But they call a foul, and this Fred Johnson guy goes to the, the free throw. Now, you have to forget, remember, they're shooting where our bench is now. And I'm standing here, Coach Otis sitting here. And one one, we're up two. And he stands there a real long time for the first one. And he makes it. So I'm counting the next one. I know the rule. Ten seconds you've got to shoot. Shoot free throw, and I still shoot that. I get to fourteen. And I that's too long. And finally the referee named of Gene Barr, an excellent NFL football official, called that turn and put his hands up just like that. I'll never forget it. Ten seconds. We get the ball out for the end of the Gets fouled in the court. Look what? One second ago, I said. One second ago, we did this. And so he gets a one and one. We're up one. And he makes the first one. He takes the ball on the second one and just shoots a little old wide jump shot and misses it. And they get to read it. And of course, the clock runs out. We win by two. And I said, right after the why <laughs> did you miss that on purpose? And he said, well, I was afraid. I, you know, think about Randall was a pretty sharp guy. He was really a sharp guy. He said, I was afraid if I made it, they might throw a long pass and somebody might shoot it and make it and we foul them and they tie the ball game up. And so he thought if I missed it, they'd get a rebound and have no chance of scoring. And of course, he was right. But it looks bad, you see, because the papers crucified the official for making the correct call. And finally, Bob Craig, who was a former... Uh, late sports writer, one of the most famous sports writer for the St. Louis papers. He read the rules and he made an apology to Gene Barr in the paper. He said that he made the right call. And he made the call at the time that it was most important. He was not afraid to make that call. But if Randall had made the point, the point I'm trying to make, if he had made that second free throw, we would have won by three. And there would have been no control. Oh, they took the game away from Moran and all that kind of thing. But they didn't. I can guarantee you, I can't guarantee you, but I will tell you, if we had played Oran 10 straight times or 100 straight times, we would have beat them every time. There's no doubt. We would beat them every time. That was not our best game, but it was the game that won the whole championship. And that uh, got some real over. Anyway, um, to people, like I said, people ask me, you know, uh, 
In the 40 years you've been here, can you think of any other teams that were good? But I said, here's the deal. When you produce a team that has a high school All-American, when you produce a team that has two state or all state players besides that high school All-American, then you can tell me you've got a team compilation and make a team on that Until then, there won't be another one. Hopefully there will be someday. All these young kids over here playing, I love watching them play. And hopefully that, you know, that's a challenge. But you just, you know, it had to be there. Ray, you had to be there. Walter, you had to be there. All you people that are old enough and put here 40 years ago and uh, watch these kids play, you just had to be there. I had a Baylor coach, I'll stop for just a second. I had a coach from the University of Baylor. Came, of course, to watch John and, and a whole bunch. And we were setting up in the balcony. And uh, Paul made reference to this, to this, the kids on the bench. You know, with Andy Richardson and Mike Sampson, Dale Davis, Dean Dickens, Richard Miller, uh, you know, Mike Burgess, those kids that didn't Kenny A. Court, that uh, didn't play start, but play, he said, that is the best group of athletes I have ever seen in a school this size. Yeah. And he was right. They could have played the baseball. Like Tommy said, we had just two classes of baseball. We won the state championship. If they had played football, we would have won. They, <laughs> they would have been great football players. <laughs> they, were, they were athletes. They were athletic from top to bottom. From down from top to bottom. Dan Richardson told me not to say anything, but I'm going to say one thing, and John would probably if he remembers back this. Danny Richardson made John Brown work just as hard in practice as anybody could. Danny gave up six inches almost to him, but he made him play every day in practice and play hard. And that's what the G, that's what the subs, or the bench players have to do, they have to play hard. You know, and they played hard in practice, my gosh, they didn't play hard. Sometimes it was a fight, but it didn't. It was fun to watch at times, but it was also kind of maddening. <laughs> anyway, I, I stopped there. Uh, like I said, the only uh, real regrets about this is the fact that we don't have the videos that we do today where you really could have seen how these kids play. Get the tape, you know, listen to Jack Dunn uh, as he gives the play-by-play, uh, that type of thing. It was, for me, uh, kind of good sweet because, like I said, they set the bar so high at Dixon High School. It's just, you know, how do you talk it? How do you talk it? Hopefully someday, and I'm sure these guys would say the same thing, hopefully someday this will have a team that's better. You know, but right now, they are the top. They're great guys. I love them dearly back then. And I, I love them now. I'm glad they were here. And I'm glad you all came to uh, enjoy this uh, fourth year. You're hopefully here in another fourth year. Thank you.